So we're not going to find the fourth coefficient, the fourth degree coefficient, but it could be found. And then the fifth degree, similar way, just keep taking derivatives. Of course, because of the stupid product rule, most of them get worse and worse. But we can certainly keep taking derivatives if we wanted to. So that is one way to solve a differential uh, equation using power series. And so we're going to look more deeply at power series now. So our first example for today, determine the interval of convergence. of 1 plus x plus 1 half x squared plus 1 third x cubed plus, so this pattern will be 1 over k x to the k. Although the first term doesn't fit this pattern, the rest of them sure do. So this is, and plus keep going. So this is summation. Well, the first term doesn't fit in the pattern. So we'll write it as one plus. And we got k equals one to infinity. One over k x to the k. It looks like the right pattern. All right, so tell me the well, first of all, what is this, what a value is this centered at? So this one's zero. If you don't see an x minus a number, then it's going to be centered at zero. So we're centered at zero. So our interval is going to obviously be centered at zero. The only question is how far do I go in either direction? So find the radius, how far you can go, and then find uh, the actual convergence or divergence at the endpoints. So get the radius first and then compute at the endpoints. And I think ratio tests, when in doubt, ratio test is the way to go. Radio, ratio test also, by the way, fails at your endpoints. You get inconclusive. So apply the ratio test.
So any questions on an interval of the radius of convergence being one? That should have been a pretty straightforward algebra reduction right there. You said do the limit of k over k plus one when you reduce it, and that's just one. And we need our rho to be less than one, and that converges. So our rho is absolute value of x, so absolute value of x less than one. So once we know our interval, our radius of convergence, we want to find the interval. So the only question is, what do uh, what happens at each of the endpoints? So we're testing one and negative one. So I lined up negative one on the left, one and positive one on the right. We'll go left side first. Converge or diverge, and ratio test is going to be inconclusive. All right, so let's say you don't know that one. Let's try the other side. Converge or diverge? Converge. Converge. So what are the other tests we have? Integral test? You could integrate from uh, 1 over x from 1 to infinity. That would be reasonable. And you would find out that there's infinite area under there, because it would be a natural log antiderivative. Uh, this is also a special series. This is a either a harmonic series or a p equals 1 series. So you need to remember the p series. Well, the other one will be alternating. This one doesn't alternate. So this one we're looking at, uh, you can't use alternating series to test for. Uh, so this is a p series. So p series was summation 1 over k to the p power, and usually these started at 1. So this converged when p was greater than 1 and diverged when p was less than or equal to 1. So this is just something to, very useful fact to remember from Calc 2. So this is a good test, a uh, good uh, series to compare to. Sometimes you just had this series right here. So <clears throat> this is a p series with p equals one. So this is going to diverge. So it diverges because it's a p equals one p series. You can also, again, go, the way we showed that that's a divergent p-series, we did a integral test on it, and it added up to infinity. Okay, so that's going to diverge. So 1 is out. So make sure we don't count the 1. Now I'm going to go to the negative 1 side. So we get something really similar, except it was negative 1 to the k power, which causes us to alternate signs. So this series, alternate signs, positive, negative, positive, negative, the terms look like they're getting smaller if we ignore the sign change. So each term is going to get a little smaller. The denominator is going to get bigger. And do the terms eventually go towards 0? Do they get arbitrarily small? So if k is a really big number, your numerator is 1 or negative 1, and you're going to keep dividing by a bigger and bigger number. So these terms are going to get really small. So that is what you need to show for alternating series. So did I write the alternating series test down this class? Probably not. I think, did I even write down any of the tests? Probably not. We did, so I applied an nth term test. I applied a ratio test. I didn't write them. Yeah, so I think I told you to find somebody who has a good Calc 2 cheat sheet and get their uh, sequence series test uh, onto your sheet. Or you can just skim through Chapter 10 in your book. So every section in Chapter 10 is basically one test. Some of them have two in them. So you want to make sure you get all those tests on your cheat sheet. So I'm going to use the alternating series test. So 
So first one, first uh, part of the hypothesis, your series has to alternate signs. So I see negative 1 to the n. That's going to go positive, negative, positive, negative. Or negative 1 to the k, technically. And this alternates signs 2. I have to show that a k absolute value is less than a k plus 1. So I need to show this is true. So I'm just going to write down what these terms are. So this is 1 over k plus 1, and a k is 1 over k. We're taking absolute value, because if you don't do absolute value, your terms go smaller, bigger, smaller, bigger, smaller, bigger, because they keep changing from positive to negative. So which of these two fractions is smaller? So the k, 1 over k plus 1 is going to be smaller it's because our denominator is bigger. So our inequality goes this way. So it is true that the ak term is going to be a little bigger than the ak plus 1 term. So the terms are going to get a little bit smaller. And last thing we need to show, lim <coughs> ak needs to approach 0. As k approaches infinity, this is pretty easy to see for this series. Some of them are a little more tricky, but this series is pretty straightforward. 1 over k as k approaches infinity will definitely be 0. So these terms get smaller and smaller towards 0. So just because you pass number 2, maybe your terms get smaller and smaller approaching 1, in which case you'd be adding up numbers very close to 1. So just because they get smaller, they have to get smaller going to 0, not going to some other number. All right, so we pass alternating series tests. So this converges by alternating series test. So we passed at negative 1. So I'm going to fill in negative 1, and we're going to not use positive 1. So we can write our interval. It's going to look like this. And remember, if you're thinking about your radius, the width of the interval is basically a diameter. So it's twice of a radius. So a radius is centered to one side, not the entire width. So if you wanted the width of the interval, you'd probably call that a diameter, not a radius. And at some point in Calc 3, I told you why it was called a radius. Because if you go higher dimensions, you're looking at a circle or a sphere or a fourth degree sphere. So that's why it's called a radius, as opposed to, I don't know what you would call it here, a half width or something like something boring like that. We call it a radius. So that is interval, how to find an interval of convergence. So now we'll do a little bit of theory for a few minutes. If you know that your summation converges for x inside some interval i. Might be open, closed, or half open, half closed. But if this converges, then you can, this converges. What that means is if you know any x value and you plug it in, inside the interval, you'll get a number out. You won't get infinity, you won't get negative infinity, or undefined. So that means any x value in the interval, I get a number out. Well, that's what it means to be a function. So I have a function is going to be defined, uh, this defines a function as long as I keep my x inside the right interval. So as long as my x is in the interval i, I can actually get a function out of this. So it's definitely going to be a function with domain so same domain as our original 
series converged for. So again, if you leave that, if you don't take your x from the interval i, you're going to most likely get infinity or negative infinity. And that's not a valid output for a function. So not only is this a function, so it should be relatively clear it's a function, follows the only function rule there is. You put in an x inside the domain, you get out a number. This function is also going to be continuous. And you can take derivatives and integrals, and they will also be continuous. So this function is a little bit nicer than just a regular function. This is going to be a continuous function. So we got the domain as i. And fx is continuous on that interval i. So it's a nice function. And f is differentiable and integrable. f is diffable and intable. So it's differentiable and integratable. It's also called the Taylor series of the function. So this is what the Taylor series is. So this, this particular series is called the Taylor of f of x. Normally we start with the function f and then create the Taylor series from it. So that's normally the order we do things in. But if you just have a convergence series you can, and you know where it converges on, you can let a function equal that. Just say this is what I'm going to call f of x and this function has these nice properties. Now as soon as you leave the interval i, who knows what happens. But inside the interval you get that they're equal and you can take derivatives. So I wrote down the formula for Taylor series. I'll write it down again of a diffable, well, this really needs to be a C infinity function. So what does this mean? This means we're going to take any function who is infinitely differentiable on some interval i. That's what that fancy notation means. Why is it important? Well, if I'm going to write the Taylor series, I'm going to assume I can take as many derivatives, really an arbitrarily high number of derivatives. So I need to be able to take all the derivatives. So you need your function to be uh, infinitely differentiable on some interval i. And this notation I'm going to use here, I'm going to use ta of x. So we're centered around a. So this is our Taylor series. And of course, you need to choose a inside your interval i. outside your interval, you have really no idea what's, uh, that the function is going to be nice. T0 of x. Sorry. T0 of x. Better not use the letter A up here then. We'll go E to the BX. That works. All right, so you need to figure out uh, what are the derivatives, and then what's the pattern, and then plug in 0. So what are the derivatives, what's the pattern between the derivatives, and then what do you get when you plug in 0? pattern for figure out what is fk, the kth derivative evaluated at zero. So do as much work as you need. So prime
probably do these four computations on the left and you should be able to see the pattern. I picked a function that wasn't too bad. Oh, we should use the letter M in front of X. What am I doing? We've used M a whole lot of times. That's what we usually use up there. Too easy. Well, you probably know already. Once it looks like this, I'd be all sucked out with the V and what to do. Oh no! So f k, the k derivative at 0 should be m to the k power. So now go ahead and use, you have this part of the Taylor series right there. Just go ahead and write out the full Taylor series now. And just remember your a is 0 here. Questions on Taylor series and find the just find the radius of convergence. You don't have to worry about two endpoints, but find the radius of convergence. So our limit for our Taylor series, we get our row just equals zero. 
does it matter what value x had for this row up here for the work I did to be true? So as long as I don't choose infinity, we're OK, or negative infinity, which obviously you've got to choose x to be between negative infinity and positive infinity. So any number I choose for x, this limit's going to be 0. So when you get your row equals 0, what that really means is your radius is infinitely large. Doesn't matter what x you choose, you're going to get 0 out for this. So this means you can also think of this as it's the reciprocal of rho, basically, which is 1 over 0. But this really means radius is infinity. And so our interval is all real numbers. So I'm going to just write down the uh, cosine expansion, the cosine Taylor series at 0. Actually, I'll write down the sine, so I don't have the cosine written here. So this is the Taylor series for sine. If you want to find it, you just have to take derivatives of sine until you see the pattern. And the pattern is basically your derivative of sine is cosine, and you're going to evaluate at 0. So it looks something like 0, 1, 0, negative 1, 0, 1, 0, negative 1, if you keep looking at derivatives. So every other one is 0. So you're basically looking at evens or odds. And how do we do an even or an odd? You use either 2k plus 1 or 2k minus 1 is generally how you write an odd number. You could do 2k plus 3 or 2k minus 3 if you need to offset it a little more. So here's how we get just odd powers. We just write 2k minus 1 we're going to use here. I need it to alternate signs every other term, so I don't, if I do 2k minus 1, it won't alternate signs. It'll always be an odd power. So it'll be negative, negative, negative. So we want to alternate signs in every other term. And you just do that minus 1 because you need your first term to be, let's see, negative, not positive. Ooh, I think it's supposed to start at 1. Pretty sure. Yes, because otherwise we'd have a negative 1 factorial. And that wouldn't make any sense. <clears throat> All right, so given sine x equals this, find Taylor at 0 of x for cosine. So what I do not want you to do is take derivatives until you see a pattern and construct the Taylor series in the regular way. What I want you to do instead is use the fact that you know about sine x to find the Taylor series for cosine. So how are sine and cosine related? Cosine is a derivative of sine. They're related in other ways, too. I can dig into the trig book and figure out some other ways to square them and square root and things like this. But the easiest way for us at this, at this time to relate them Derivative of sine equals cos. So that's a pretty easy relationship right there. So all I'm going to do is take derivative of what equals sine. So I'm just going to swap out sine for this summation.
So whatever the derivative is, is going to be cosine. So first things first, let's go ahead and we have a derivative of a bunch of terms added together. So I'm going to use the sum rule for derivatives. So this is the derivative of each of the terms individually, and then add those together. So this looks like the summation and the derivative changing places. So the sum rule for derivatives looks like these operators commute. And that's just a, how the notation works out. What is this derivative now? So we're not worried about the sum at this moment. We're just worried about the derivative. What is this negative 1 to the k minus 1 as far as the derivative is concerned? Constant. So derivative doesn't care about k's, derivative is looking for x's, and again, constant. So I can push the derivative past these two terms right here. So really, what's the derivative of x to the 2k minus 1? 2k minus 1 times 2k minus 1 minus 1, or 2k minus 2. What algebra can we do here? So the biggest piece of the factorial cancels out the 2k minus 1. So if I cancel these, I have to be very careful. So they don't cancel out to 0, but they do reduce. So they're going to reduce to 2k minus 2 factorial, like that. So I drop my highest factorial when I cancel. So you could leave it like this. I see 2k minus 2, 2k minus 2. That's kind of ugly. It's correct to leave it like this. So what I'm going to do, let's factor a 2 out of both of these so then I can see k minus 1 everywhere. So this algebra is going to be a very small step. I'm going to have to overuse parentheses. <coughs> so that was pretty easy algebra right there. Just factored a 2 out so I can see k minus 1 in a bunch of places. And I'm just going to use k instead of k minus 1. Now I'm going to screw everything up unless I pay attention to where k started. So everywhere I saw k minus 1, I just put k there. So the way I think about this, when k equals 1, what do we get for k minus 1? 0. So when k was 1, I got 0, 0, 0. So I'm shifting my index. I shifted it. Over here, basically, I added one everywhere. So what I need to do down here is the opposite. So I'm going to subtract one. So we're going to start at 0. And it should give me the exact same terms in both of these series. You don't have to do this, but I think it makes it look a lot nicer than it did above. So this is what I call shifting indexes or re-indexing. We're just going to you know, increase. In this case, we dropped our k value by 1, so we increased everywhere else we saw k. So we compensated. 
there is no last term, so I don't have to worry about the last term shifting up or down one, because I go to infinity. So I don't have that problem at the other end. If I went to a finite value like 100, I'd have to worry, well, should I stop at 101 or 99? Then I'd have to worry about the end. But because we go all the way to infinity, you, there is no end, so I don't shift that by one. So this should be sine, no, cosine. This should be cosine x. And the interval of convergence stays the same, which I never wrote down. Interval of convergence for this is negative infinity, positive infinity. The basic rule, if your domain of your, if your function is differentiable everywhere, your Taylor series will uh, exist everywhere. You only have a problem if you're uh, basically going to have a vertical asymptote or if for some other reason, like a square root function, you're going to not be defined past certain values. That's where your Taylor series will break down. It's basically where your function broke down. So whatever, if you're differentiable on all real numbers, your Taylor series is going to be uh, valid for all real numbers. Oh, that's a good question. Uh, yes, you can. So it will be equal to those quantities. The problem with multiplying and dividing, or specifically dividing power series, you don't get a power series. Because okay. you're going to have powers of x in the denominator. Right. So, a, uh, <coughs> so the question was, we know tangent is, so this is something separate, related, but separate. So I could write these two power series for sine and cosine, but the problem is dividing a power series is not itself a power series. So I will have something equal, uh, but then I have to be extra careful because uh, tangent's not differentiable everywhere. So I have to now pick, I have to be very careful when I pick an x value to center at, I'm only gonna be able to go over maximum of something like pi over two or pi, depending on what x value I choose. I can only go a very small amount over before I hit the vertical asymptotes every pi. So my interval of convergence can be very small. Uh, so I will get this. I can also take successive derivatives of tangent. They're going to look really ugly, but I could keep taking tangents. And I could get a single power series, but it's only going to be valid in a very small interval, um, which is that power series is not found by dividing power series. It's found by taking derivatives in a very painstaking way, because you're going to first derivative of secant squared, and then it gets worse after that. So it's going to be lots of tangents and secants multiplied together. And maybe when you find your sixth derivative, you'll see a pattern. Um, I can't see one off the top of my head, but I haven't started taking derivatives yet. So there may be a pattern emerging, but it's probably going to be ugly. So we're going to look at Taylor's theorem now. So what Taylor's, we've written out Taylor polynomials. What Taylor's theorem says is if you stop, you obviously don't have an infinite amount of time. So I can write down an infinite series, but we're not going to be able to go and, and figure out all the terms. Um, we could write a pattern for some of the terms, but in regular usage, you're going to go up to a certain degree. So whatever it is, fifth degree, Maybe if you're using a computer, you can go to a hundredth degree, something like that. But there's going to be a certain amount you can't go past. And even if I can write this down, let's see, somewhere here, even though this equals, these are equal, if I told you uh, x is pi over 2, how many terms are you really going to figure out? 100, 1,000, 10,000 if you're really dedicated. But the point is, you're not going to add up an infinite number of terms. So that's not possible. So even if you write it out, that's OK. But you're never going to be able to compute an infinite, number of, uh, an infinite number of terms added together. So Taylor's theorem tells us how close of an approximation we have. So that's what Taylor's theorem tells us.
So this is if f has derivatives of all orders. So already, I can write this statement a whole lot faster if I use C infinity. So if you want to make this way shorter, you can write if f is in C infinity of i. So we'll just save a lot of writing and write that instead. I think your book has what I just crossed out. So if f is a C infinity uh, function, Then uh, and of course we're taking a we need to expand around a value inside the interval. So I'm just writing out terms of the Taylor series. not going to infinity. I'm going to go to the nth term. So if I stop here, these are not equal. If I stop right here, these are not actually equal. It's only equal if I keep going to infinity. So there are more terms. Obviously, there are infinitely many more terms. So what I'm going to put over here is a new function, r little n of x. And this represents what all the rest of the terms add up to. So it's what's missing. So Taylor, Taylor's theorem tells us how to figure out this function. So we call this the remainder so you could of course write I'll write this off to the side I can explicitly write Rn of x it's not hard to do it'll be f k derivative of a k factorial x minus a to the k what k value do we start at we will start at m plus one because that would be the one right after the where we left off but again that's defined in an infinite way so that's not terribly helpful to actually compute it's good for theory not helpful for computing so we still have the exact same problem we had before so what we're going to do instead is write an alternative version. And I'm writing a weird x on purpose. So this looks like the one single term that comes next. Where this capital X is some number between X and A. Well, that doesn't really narrow it down very much. So it could be any number between x and a. What number is it? The one that makes it equal. However, what this lets us do is figure out a worst case scenario for how big positive or how small negative this could get. So it lets us do a worst case analysis of how much our error could be. 
So it's not our goal to figure out exactly what is Rn of x for some particular x. It's our goal to figure out how, what's the worst that this could be. How far off could we be if we go to eight terms? So that's what we're going to be doing with this Taylor theorem. Um, another thing if r and x approaches 0 as n approaches infinity. So what does this mean? The remainder, if I kept going further and further along, the remainder gets smaller and smaller. So this is another way to say this series converges at that x value. So if this happening, then the series converges. So what that means is, <coughs> intuitively, if I look at the way it's written, <coughs> I just got lazy and wrote Rn of x for these terms at the end. If I went a whole lot further, instead of stopping at n, if I stopped at n plus a trillion, this remainder would be really small. If I stopped at n plus 100 trillion, this remainder would be even smaller. Meaning that eventually, if you pick a big enough n, this gets very, very small. Which is to say that it converges itself. So that's a way to look at the remainder and decide about convergence. <coughs>